I'm David Knowles, and this is a special episode of Ukraine, The Latest. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody's gonna break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Last month, I had the pleasure of speaking to Dr. Leon Aaron, writer, historian, and senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Aaron was born in Moscow and came to the US from the former Soviet Union as a child refugee in 1978. We spoke about the transformation of Russian politics and society under Vladimir Putin, and about his new book, Riding the Tiger, Vladimir Putin's Russia and the Uses of War. Here is our conversation. I'm Leon Aaron, and I am a refugee from the Soviet Union. I came to the U.S. in 1978. I received my Ph.D. from Columbia University in 1985 and pretty much been working on then the Soviet Union and then Russia since about 88, 89. Published three books, and the fourth one is titled Riding the Tiger, Vladimir Putin's Russia and the Uses of War. And as a writer, I think the ultimate value of the book is what it is that you discover yourself. And actually, this probably has nothing to do, well, it does not have immediate relevance, but I think it has a a great deal uh, of relevance for the future of Russia. And that is that as I kept researching, and, and there are about 200 sources, all of them are Russian language sources, very few secondary sources. As I dived that deep into Russian sources, what struck me is both the volume and the toxicity of the poison that Putin injected in that society. I knew some of it, obviously, but but the sheer viciousness of what he injected are playing on past humiliations, playing up the uh, fall of the Soviet Union. And as every poison, the real damage is based on the interaction between the poison and the body. And he knew exactly where to hit. The the trauma of the loss of the superpowership, the trauma of the dissolution of the Soviet Union. We were there to counterbalance America, and now we're nothing. And there, there are a number of these things on which he played so skillfully because for him it was natural. He was one of those. He was the up-and-coming KGB officer. And, of course, this was the elite, second only to the party nomenclatura. Remember the 70s, post-Vietnam. Russia is in Nicaragua, Ethiopia. We're winning. We are finally winning over America. And, of course, detente, as seemed to them, for a good reason, a recognition that America could not go on without us. And, boom, that was taken away from them. And taken is the operative term because they never believed, Putin and those around him never believed that the fall of the Soviet Union was due to a political, economic, and largely, this is what my previous book is about, moral reasons. No, it was a plot by the West. You spoke about the toxicity and the viciousness. Could you talk about how that played out in Russian society in the maybe the 90s and the 2000s? Well, the 90s, the funny thing is, the 90s is one of the most misunderstood periods. And of course, I wrote a book about it, largely a biography of Boris Yeltsin. And without going into details, one of your, actually, and mine, favorite philosopher and essayist, Isaiah Berlin, wrote, liberty is liberty. It's not a good night's sleep. It's not equality. And it's not happiness. In other words, In the 90s, Russia was the freest it has ever been, it had ever been. All other things happened too. There was a growth of inequality, there was impoverishment, although in the end, a totally different economy, a totally modernized economy were handed to Putin on a silver platter. Hence his enormous popularity for the first two terms, of course, also due to the tripling, no, no, not even tripling, quadrupling, about 10 times increase in the price of oil. When Putin took over from Yeltsin, the oil, or at least the Russian oil, the Ural brand, was selling $14 to $16 a barrel, when at the end of his second term, 2008, it was about $150 a barrel. But the trauma remained. In other words, it was a layer of society, largely elites, largely cultural elites, 
who reveled, I can show you interviews and books, who reveled in that liberty. All of a sudden, the writers didn't have censorship. All of a sudden, the Iron Curtain was gone, and so on. But that was, you know, a thin layer. All the rest of the society saw a sudden loss of pensions, sudden loss of salaries. Of course, the, the fair question is, which revolution ever paid salaries or, or named me a revolution that paid salaries on time or pensions on time. In the main case, it was all straightened out by the end of the 90s. But that added to the trauma. In other words, not only we lost a, a superpower that was military, economic, and, which was very important to the Russians, moral counterpart to the United States, but the, we went through this enormous suffering. And... Putin played on that too. He called them the, the sort of uh, devil may care, primarily has the approximate translation, devil may care 90s. And he played on that too. So in addition to the humiliation, there was very palpable suffering. And he played on that too. Can we talk a little bit about militarism in Russian society? Just on a sort of on a personal level, what does it look like for a normal Russian? How do they interact with the military? What symbols are used? What would you see in the street? I'm asking that because we're here at the moment in the United States and the relationship with the American public, with the American military, is very different to the one we have in the UK. So it's eye-opening for us, you know, seeing the fly passes at the football games and that, <laughs> right. that sort of thing. What's it like in Russia? Goodness. Let's start by talking about the Victory Day, the 9th of May. Again, I mentioned in my book that First of all, it was never a holiday. Stalin celebrated it in 1946, that was it. The first celebration of the victory in World War II, or as the Russians call it, the Russians call it Valika Otechistunne Vaina, which is Great Patriotic War, which is also interesting because it shows that the Russians did it alone and Putin played on that too. There was no world war. There were no allies. There were no Americans, British, French. It was all the Russians. So there was no celebration. Then there was a celebration without heavy tanks and in the 90s without missiles, tanks, or artillery on the Red Square. Two th come 2000, Putin's second term, it, it became North Korea. He rolled out all... The Soviet Union did have it, but on the anniversary of the October Revolution, November, uh, November 7th. Putin now turned the celebration of that victory into sheer triumph of Russian will. Now, of course, there was always that component. But if somebody who grew up there, the best Russian movies about the war, the best Russian songs about the war, it's all sadness and it's all farewell to friends who, who were killed. To recall a very popular um, song of my childhood, it was a holiday with tears in your eyes. Well, tears disappeared. It was all a triumph. Now on the 9th of May, and of course, by the way, no Russian leader with the exception of Yeltsin, once or twice, spoke at the... It was always a peaceful celebration. Putin speaks at every 9th of May at the Red Square, presiding over those monstrous parades. With, with each speech leading to the war, by the way, it, it was always darker, and the tonality was increasingly dark and shot through, with, not with the with the memory of the millions killed, but with the affirmation that we did it then and we can do it again. And incidentally, you'll see photos in my book, that became a slogan. There are cars parading through Russian cities and it says, если нужно, можем повторить. If need be, we'll repeat it. Now, again, <laughs> there are some outrageous photos. There are baby carriages fashioned by tanks there are onesies in, in the color of the uniforms of World War II. There are uh, parades of kindergartners where they pledge allegiance to the Russian army. School children dance. I have one of those songs to which they dance. And it was something like, our wonderful army, we love you. And when we grow up, we'll join and, and so on and so forth. The critics call it Pabeda Besia, which is an interesting term. So Pabeda... It's a compound noun. Pabeda is victory. Besia is a Russian term where the root could be both the devil, bes, and also besitza, to go crazy. So it's in that term, Pabeda Besia, 
encompasses this absolutely outrageous celebration of the, literally celebration of that incredibly painful event in Russian history. The tears are gone, and it's all triumphalism. And that, of course, is just the epitome of what's happening. But there are now classes, even in grade schools, where the guns, Kalashnikovs, AK-47, or they probably now AK, where, where the children are taught to shoot automatic weapons, where children are taught to assemble and disassemble, where they run around the schoolyard pretending to throw grenades. And even in the Soviet Union, yes, in college, I experienced that. You had to have some sort of military uh, training, but it never went down all the way to grade schools. And it's now uh, part of the curriculum. What do you think the implications of this increasing militarism are for Russian society? Well, remember, uh, all of this, including, of course, the war on Ukraine or the invasion of Ukraine, is done to sustain the regime. The reason are domestic. If you look at, at Putin's sudden discovery of the mortal peril of the NATO expansion, which was presumably that and, and of course, denazification, that's a separate issue, of Ukraine, were ostensible reasons for invading Ukraine. All of a sudden, he discovered the expansion of NATO 10, 15 years after it happened. Why? Because when he took over Russia in his third term, he realized and he was told, and I have numbers in my book, that short of liberalization of both political and economic, incidentally, China faces the same problem, the economy is not going to grow, it was not going to grow 7 8% as it grew in his first two terms, thus cementing his astronomic popularity. And he began to switch the economic progress and the growth of incomes from as the foundation of his popularity, as the foundation of his personal popularity, which is the same as regime's popularity, to what I called militarized patriotism. We're surrounded by enemies, but don't worry, I will defend you. If, of course, the so-called social contract that everybody was talking about in the early 2000s, you stay out of politics and I'll take care of you economically, became state of politics and I will protect you. And so he settled that tiger. And in support of this narrative, there are all kinds of things. There's this militarization of the society. There is absolutely outrageous propaganda, which frankly, in its crudity, I must say, surpasses the Soviet propaganda I grew up with. Could you give us some examples of that? What have you seen? <laughs> well, the second most powerful man in Russia, of whom I'm yet to write, is Nikolai Patrushev. Remember, these are all colleagues of Putin. This is all the 1970s officers, KGB officers in St. Petersburg. This is whom he puts in key positions because as he knows them professionally and grew professionally with them. And Nikolai Patrushev, and I'm giving you just, just that example, says, well, the Pentagon developed COVID. The Pentagon surrounded Russia with uh, biological labs and pushing all kinds of viruses on Russia. The other, other propagandists, uh, Solovyov, for example, or a couple of others, push absolutely outrageous things, such as NATO was about to attack us from Ukraine. And in fact, Putin in his speech addressed to the nation on the morning of the invasion said that we cannot repeat what Hitler did to us on June 22nd, 1941. Just the monstrosity of those lies is outrageous. You talked about how you detected a sort of changing tone of Putin's speeches as you were watching them on, on, on um, Victory Day over the years ahead of the full-scale invasion. Something that Serhii Plokhi, the Ukrainian historian, told me about his book when he was researching his book was that he was surprised a little to find how much Putin, in his view, agreed with the, the 19th century historians about Russia's history and its culture and its place in the world. Could you bring us inside the mind of Vladimir Putin and his changing character over the years as, as you've seen it? Let me start by saying that in the book I have Putin presiding over and speaking at the opening of two monuments. Who, who is the czar that, that Putin ordered the two monuments to? Alexander III, the most reactionary czar, probably even more reactionary than Nicholas I. And also, by the way, an avowed anti-Semite who encouraged pogroms in Russia. 
And what Putin said was, there are various things about, about Alex, you could say about Alexander III, but he established Russia as a world power. He protected Russia. And because everybody was afraid of him, that was an unusual period of peace that Russia had. Of course, in part, the, the, the period of peace was due to Russia's horrific defeat where in, in Crimea by the Turks, the French, and the British primarily. Do you remember the attack of the uh, Light Brigade? But never mind that. So to be respected is to be feared. This is something that, of course, Putin brought down from his semi-urchin childhood in the slums of post-war Leningrad. There is no respect without fear. And so, yes, there was an evolution. Actually, you look at all of those authoritarian leaders, and they start much more reasonable and progressive than, I don't know if it's a matter of age. I think it's partly the age, but partly, at first, you, you try to do more or less the right thing. And we could point to what Putin did, in, especially in his first term. And then it becomes a question of holding on to power. And that begins to be a paramount issue. That, incidentally, is also one of the aspects of Putin's kind of meta-narrative that deeply appealed to the Russians. To be respected is to be afraid. Everybody was afraid of the Soviet Union. I have statistics there. I have public opinion poll where the Russians were asked, is that a good thing? And about three quarters of them said, yeah, it's good that we're feared. So that is the view of Russians past. There's a very important, another very important propaganda narrative that Putin was rather successful in pushing on the society. And that is in his stem winder of a speech on the account of taking Crimea, I think it was March 12, 2014, he said, the West, this is not new, this, this criticism and they're threatening us with sanctions. Uh, this is not new. Every time Russia, as he put it, stood up or raised off its knees, the West wanted to slap it down and the West wanted to destroy it. Subvert, suppress, sanction, destroy, block. And that is his view of the past. And of course, his, the official narrative, and incidentally, you asked me who, who else, there's a, a white Russian emigre by the name of Ivan Ilyin. There are a couple of other reactionary. Ilyin was 20th century, but there's, for example, a guy by the name of Leontiev, the 19th century diplomat. The view is the West could never understand Russia. The West is always out to get Russia. And yet we're defiant, and yet we always win. And that is the message. Let's come to the full-scale invasion. You said Putin cannot win this war and he cannot walk away. Could you talk us through your thinking there? And I think the implications of that's probably quite chilling. They are. They are. So he has neither the wherewithal uh, military, despite the ancient Russian shells that Korea is going to give him. There's some contraband. Yes, there's some chips flowing in. But for example, the Russian civil aviation is almost to a standstill. The rumor is that, that they, they go and cannibalize the imported, of previously imported, before sanctions, refrigerators, and so on, in order to get the chips and put them in, in their military technology. So most importantly, he does not have the morale. They're now sitting out behind minefields. They're sitting out be behind what's known as dragon teeth, which is a, a anti-tank concrete barriers, spikes rather. A, a triple line of defenses and shooting at, at attacking Ukrainians with missiles and drones. And unfortunately, because the Ukrainians do not have any air defenses, just shooting at them from the airplanes and helicopters. Yes, that could be done. Yes, he brought it to a, a sort of a standstill attrition, although sort of World War I situation. But the Ukrainians are pressing on. And he... I'd be very surprised if he masters any significant uh, attack of his own that could have strategic implications. And so from Putin's point of view, there is only one hope, and that is that the so-called Ukraine fatigue, the West gets tired, the West pushes Ukraine to settle. And of course, that settlement will be on entirely on Putin's terms, almost no doubt holding Crimea, and maybe, I don't, I'm not sure, holding on to most of Donbass, if not all. 
So Ukraine loses 20% of its territory. But two can play the waiting game. If there isn't Ukraine fatigue, what do you do then? He, he's resisted national mobilization, which will be extremely unpopular um, because at this point, it's largely the national minorities from the Caucasus, the Turkic people from Siberia that disproportionately send to the front. The children of the elite in Moscow, St. Petersburg, barely touched. If there is a national mobilization, it will be extremely unpopular. But I assume, even assuming that, even assuming that there is a national mobilization, it, yes, it will simply increase the amount of cannon fodder. It's not going to change strategically the situation in the front. So what do you do? The economy, on the surface, the, the sanctions are not visible. Uh, just below the surface, they're very visible. If you go to specific Russian sites, if you know where to read, steadily, steady degrading of the Russian economy. And of course, Putin, uh, the, the military expenditures are up 40% from before the war. Yes, there is still some funds left accumulated from before, the, in, including the National Welfare Fund. He'll have to start printing money. And when, what was that, sometime in August, the ruble dropped to 100 rubles per dollar, settling at about 80 to 90, which is as high as it was in the 90s, by the way, um, or as low, I should say. He knows that eventually people will get tired and will have the Prigozhin mutiny, which is also interesting because it has nothing to do with the people. It has to do, I personally believe, with the growing dissatisfaction in the army, which is forced to sustain a meat-grinding World War I warfare without any hope of winning. No cadre, no, no officer, and eventually no soldier would want to participate in that war. I, I wrote somewhere that, look what happened in 1917. We're tired of <laughs> war of attrition. The Russian soldiers went, and at that time, in, the saying went, turn our bayonets onto St. Petersburg and Moscow. Incidentally, in his first address to the nation on account of Prigozhin mutiny, Putin invoked invoke that situation. He specifically referred to 1917. So here's where Putin is. How can he end this war? I don't want to be my own spoiler alert, but there is a final chapter in my book. And in very general terms, I think Putin is going to escalate to a mind-boggling situation where essentially he will confront the West with a nuclear ultimatum. Stop this war, push the Ukrainians to stop the war or else. There is a chapter in the book called Worshipping the Nukes. You'll see the photos of the Russian Orthodox priests blessing strategic missiles with holy water. There's an annual address, kind of State of Russia address. And in one of them was, the, the final part was devoted precisely to that. He showed new nukes, his new nuclear toys, and basically said, this is what we have. You know that Putin now has a patron saint of the Russian nuclear forces. I did not know that. Who's yes. that? Yes. <laughs> yes. It's Seraphim of Sarov. So Seraphim of Sarov was a monk, or rather a hermit. He was not a kind of, he was not part of the organized monastery. He was a hermit. And Russia's last czar, Nicholas II, uh, declared him a saint. I believe 1910 or something like that. The funny thing is that Sarov where it's about 120, 140 kilometers south, southwest of Moscow. That's the place where the, the patron of Soviet nuclear forces, Lavrenti Beria, he is the one who well, first stole primarily from the Manhattan Project and, and various Soviet sympathizers, but chose, for the reason I don't understand and nobody knows quite why, chose Sarov, that the little place where Seraphim lived as the headquarters of the Russian nuclear industry. And of course, all the monks were killed or sent to Gulag, all the, uh, all the priests were shot. That's where it is today, by the way. And so in, uh, I think I have it in my book, 2000 something, 12, no, even earlier, Putin goes there and he participates in the service over the, the remnants of Seraphim, and I have a photo where he crosses himself. And the then uh, patriarch of all Russia, at that time it was uh, Alexei, is with him and they bless the procession in honor of Seraphim of Sarov. 
So Putin is literally obsessed with the nuclear weapons, which, by the way, is the only part of the Soviet superpowership that's left in Russia. So there's an additional reason for him to love it. For, I, th- I think people in the West and outside Russia, obviously we find it very difficult to follow the politics. We don't necessarily understand the drives and the motivations of people. Looking to the future, what kind of things should we be looking for to help us understand what might happen next? Goodness, the first crack, of course, was the Prigozhin mutiny which was very important. It was largely, to me, not a military, but a political thing. What was especially telling about it is not what happened militarily. After all, it fizzled. But the reception it got, look, he gets to Rostov on the Don, which is the headquarters of the Russian. Russia has four or five military districts. This is the head of a southern military district, right? This headquarters. What happens there? People are out there taking selfies, giving them cookies, giving them water, giving them coffee. Where's the revulsion? Where are the Russian flags? Where are the portraits of Putin? Where are the curses? And shaken and fist shaken at the Prigozhin troop. No, they were welcomed. And what happened? Well, with the exception of two inept, I think there's one helicopter and one jet fighter, which the Prigozhin troops shut down. What happened to the troops? What happened to the National Guard, led by by Putin's former bodyguard, Viktor Zolotov? Where's the regular police? Where's the regular army? They melted away as the Wagner advanced. So to me, this was very interesting. Oh, there was another thing. There was some very tepid, as we learned later, and I don't know if it was sort of interpolating in in trying to refashion the past to to face the future. At the time, I don't recall any strident statements in support of Putin by anyone, by his ministers, by his prime minister, by his top uh, military leaders. So all of that showed a big crack. It's almost like a river under the ice. Yes, on the surface, everything is fine. But you look at that crack, the, the, the deep fissure that the Wagner mutiny developed or inflicted on the Russian body politic. And the below that ice, there's the things are very fluid. So you asked what to look for. Okay, so this is this already happened, and I think it was very telling. I would say continue to look at Telegram uh, channels. You go to Instagram, and this is of course was Prigozhin's domain, and you listen to officers, soldiers. Don't watch Russian TV. It's horrible. It's worse than the Soviet TV. But fortunately, there there's so-called social media. And I think that's where you have to look at and look at the objective situation in the economy. For a while, I'm not sure if it's still the case, but for a while, the basic economic data were banned. Now, somehow, we do know something that the National Bank publishes or, or Central Bank of Russia, the Minister of Economy, the Minister of Finance, they all talk rather frankly. And you have to look at, at some unexciting, boring stuff, such as inflation, such as the level of industrial production, such as the Russian complaints about air travel, which, like I said, is virtually come to a standstill. I, I would not get on the Russian plane if, if I could, even if I were not <laughs> forever uh, uh, banned by this regime from uh, Russia. Because under the Soviets, of course, they had air flawed. But since then, all the planes were imported. And what's more important, they were serviced by foreign companies and overhauled, which of course is the key to safety. All of that is gone. Uh, God knows what, who services them now. So, so these are the sorts of things I would look at. When you look back over the past 18 months and maybe before as well, what do you think in your analysis uh, you've got absolutely right? But also what maybe have you got wrong? What, <laughs> what have you learned? That's All right, it's, it's funny. I make a clean breast of it in the introduction to the book. Since... 2018, I believed that that tiger of militarized patriotism that Putin settled will take him to war. In political science, it's called path dependence. You take one step, another step, and then you can't get out. That's why the book is called Riding the Tiger. If you shift increasingly, and probably by now entirely, the legitimacy of your regime and your own personal popularity, which is the same, by the way. The regime has no legitimacy. It's all Putin's popularity to militarized patriotism, which is everybody's against us, but we're defiant. 
and we will win, it's just a short version of militarized patriotism, then that tiger would have to take you to war because the tiger requires more meat. The bloodier, the warmer, the better. You can't just say, oh, everybody's against us, but I will protect you. And then what? Give us the meat. But I predicted the war, but I predicted the wrong war. <laughs> I thought, and so did everybody else, that invading Ukraine would be in military, political, moral, international terms, complete madness, which of course it was, and it is, it is, that Putin will pick on a more vulnerable NATO member. And I had Latvia and Estonia as the two countries where he could foment something like Crimea in a sense that they're very significant, about a quarter of the population of both those small, very small nations, Baltic nations, are Russian, ethnic Russians. And some of them with rather strong support of Putin, much less now, but between the wars. And he could foment discontent and he could say, I'm there to liberate the, pretty much what he said in Donbass. In other words, I predicted the war, but it was a wrong war. In my defense, I have to say that I was wrong for the right reason. It's madness. It's suicidal for Russia and Putin's regime, or nearly suicidal, unless, of course, he pulled that nuclear rabbit out of the hat. It's suicidal for anybody to attack um, Ukraine, a nation of 44 million people, second largest to Russia, place in Europe, and a country with tremendous history, with very graphic history of resistance to foreign invaders. All you have to do is to look at World War I, you have to look how they resisted the Bolsheviks, how they re how the, the partisans during World War II, and incidentally, partisans after World War II, mm. when the Soviets tried to reoccupy, especially Western Ukraine. So it was madness. Putin was madder than I thought. So that's where I was wrong. But again, putting myself on a spoiler alert, the last chapter of the book resurrects a bit of a of that what the Russians used to call small victorious war. I think it's still up his sleeve if he wants to blackmail NATO. My very final question is just to ask the picture you've painted of Russian society is so increasingly militarized, the economy's breaking and degrading slowly. It sounds like a society that's broken. How, how can it come back from this? What needs to happen? Russia has a tradition of, of coming back from, it used to be called smutne vreme, if you remember, the, the time of trouble. Russia was... Funny, uh, one of current heroes is, of course, the absolutely murderous, sick tyrant of Ivan IV, what's known as Ivan the Terrible. After his death, it was a complete devastation. He completely destroyed the economy. He completely destroyed the society. The entire villages were wiped off. The people were dying of starvation. They came back from that. They came back from that again after the absolutely horrific civil war, which now the numbers are such that it probably was, Russia lost more people in that civil war than it lost in World War I. It was an absolutely horrific in its brutality. Came back, granted came back to eventually become a Stalinist state. Then there were the 90s, of course, no comparison to post Ivan the Terrible or post Soviet, post Bolshevik coup in, in 1917, but still very tough time. It's back, was back. So, you know, great countries, uh, resilient. I think it would come back. And incidentally, contrary to what some of my colleagues suggest, a Russian history shows, incidentally, the fear now, oh, somebody will be somebody worse than Putin. Okay. First of all, in every revolution, with some exceptions, of course, it's not th this sort of the Marxist image of peasants with pitchforks running at villas is a fantasy. Certainly every modern revolution was done in the big cities and actually led by middle class, upper middle class, intelligentsia. You could look at, uh, you know, Robespierre and his friends. You could look at Lenin and his friends. And incidentally, you could also look at who, okay, Yeltsin was a, a very special case, but surrounding him, again, those who effected the moral revolution of the 87-91 were into the intelligentsia. And so... The general story of the Russian history, the general trend, is that the, at least initially, the next regime is more liberal. There are some exceptions, but you look at, for example, Catherine the Great, as she corresponded with Voltaire and, and welcomed Diderot to her court. You look at Alexander I, 
who actually said initially that authoritarianism is really a thing of the past. Pushkin has a poem about this. Uh, of course, as we discussed, once it became a question of power, he forgot about all of those pretty dreams of republics. But as one of the leaders of the coalition that defeated Napoleon, he was fine with the restoration of, eventually it was the Bourbons, but he was fine with the restoration even of the French Republic. So he was liber liberal. Now, he was followed by a reactionary, Nicholas I, his son, solely because of the Decemberist Revolt. Nicholas I was scared, and then he was scared again by the 1848-49 revolutions all over Europe. And he and Prussia were among those who strangled those revolutions, including the one in Hungary. Isn't that funny that Russia comes to Hungary every hundred years to suppress a liberal revolution? So then he loses a war in Crimea, and there is a revolution. There is a revolution from above by his son, Alexander II, including one of the greatest policy moves in Russian history, which is the liberation of the serfs. He abolished serfdom, essentially at the same time as the U.S. was abolishing slavery in, in the United States, 1861. And even more, there is almost the abolition of censorship, almost all kinds of progressive, deeply progressive ideas and policies. And when he was killed by, I think, one of the world's first suicide bombers in 1881, he had in his pocket a project for, at least as a project for a discussion of a constitution and the creation of a constitutional monarchy. He gets killed, we get Alexander III, who both in his personal predilection, but also his father having been killed by a leftist bomber, was, as I mentioned, probably the most reactionary czar. Then you have, of course, a period where you had an idiot. I'm sorry, an idiot Nicholas II. Then, of course, you had Lenin. But look what happened after Stalin. Liberalization again, Khrushchev. Look what happened after Brezhnev and Andropov. Liberalization by Gorbachev. So it's a seesaw, and it's, of course, it could go the other way. But, by the way, one of the reasons I, I believe Putin cannot lose this war is because he knows the Russian history. And one thing that the Russians don't generally forgive is a military defeat. Uh, you look at Nicholas I uh, with the Crimea War. You look at Nicholas II with World War II. You look at, to a certain extent, you look at Afghanistan. And of course, you look at Khrushchev and the debacle with the Cuban crisis. He was ousted two years later. So Putin knows this history. He cannot, to the extent that he can, I don't know how much control he has ultimately, but while he's alive, he will do everything not to lose the war. I'm not saying to win it, but not to lose the war. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thank that you. was really fascinating. Thank you. Thank right. you. Thanks. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. We'll sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine The Latest as soon as it is released do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was produced by Charles Gear, and the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.